Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, we are uh, starting with the next session. We have with us today uh, Mari Conway, who is running the Foresight Futures, a uh, Foresight practice based in Melbourne in Australia. And uh, she's kind of a legend in Foresight because she's yeah. been around Foresight for the last, I'm not, I'm not even sure how long to say, but you've been since ever. Uh, I've heard things from you from a very long time ago. So she's going to be with us today presenting how to design new conversations about futures. So uh, Mary, uh, I leave it to you and uh, I mute myself. I go off the screen. I'm, I put your presentation on the screen, okay? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Hi everyone, um, today I'm going to be talking about the Futures Conversation Framework that I'm developing. You can download a PDF of the slides right now at the link that's on the slide that, that's showing now. So I developed the framework as part of my PhD research when I was looking for a way to enable new conversations about possible futures for universities to be constructed. Um, it can be applied in any organisational context though and my work since my thesis was passed this year in January has been trying to make the framework practical. So I've also reframed my business, Thinking Futures has become Foresight Futures and I'm now um, focusing on how we can have deeper and meaningful, more meaningful conversations about possible futures. So I'll talk about these three things today. I'll introduce you to the framework. We'll talk about the four conversations in more detail, and then I'll just touch on my next steps to keep it, keep it developing. So let's get started with the framework itself. It draws on integral futures, uh, and it's designed to ensure that any useful conversation about possible futures will take place in a space that is inclusive, collaborative and participative with the diversity of perspectives in the room that can inform how our possible futures are understood in the present. So for me, useful futures are those that ex explore both individual and collective beliefs and assumptions about futures, the social and organisational context in which the organisations take place and agreed actions um, that we're going to implement. They are conversations, importantly, that value imagination as a source of data. They are also conversations that take place over time as individual mindsets shift and a collective foresight capacity emerges in an organisation. So this is the integral frame I used. The four quadrants are an important part of integral theory and I use them because they do overtly integrate this tacit side with the empirical side of organisations and each quadrant holds a different way of knowing and importantly too all quadrants must be considered to the same degree if we're going to achieve meaningful change. So the upper left is a subjective quadrant um, that constructs the intentional interior world of the individual. The lower left is the collective cultural world of the organisation where individual beliefs and experiences are shared resulting in collective meanings and worldviews that generate shared me meaning in an organisation. It's the, the way we do things around here, the, the rules of the game. The lower right is the external social system of the organisation that's shaped by global change and that creates the context in which the organisation exists and society as well. 
This is the environment in which the university's legitimacy is uh, determined by its degree of functional fit or strategic fit with this space. And the upper right uh, quadrant is where the empirically observable and measurable aspects of the organisation, including processes, infrastructure and behaviours of individuals as they interact become visible. So this is the adaption of um, the integral theory four quadrants that I did for my conversations framework. The left side is the invisible side of the organisation. It focuses on developing individual and collective futures consciousness. So that for me means developing our individual and collective foresight capacities. The right side is the visible organisation and that focuses on orienting the organisation to the future, developing a long-term perspective. So before I talk about the conversations in detail, I'll just um, run through quickly these four points about how the uh, framework actually emerged in my work and my research um, and I'll run through them quickly. So I had this quandary. Um, it started to emerge over the 20 years or so that I've been practicing foresight. And this question on this slide is the quandary. Why can some people imagine the future and others can't? And in the beginning, I just accepted that some people didn't want to engage their imaginations, but I came to realize that there was much more to it than this. There must be a reason why in every workshop I ran, I had people who could let their imaginations free and people who couldn't. So in my PhD research, I found neurological and psychological research, which provided some answers for me. I wasn't going to go into that in this presentation in any detail, but the link on the bottom of the slide there um, will link you to a paper that I've written um, that goes into the more uh, connections between uh, neuroscience and foresight. Then I started to connect the dots um, and I wrote this blog post about the thinking and doing of strategy. So I had become convinced that unless we have some sort of integral approach in our work, then our outcomes will remain largely superficial. This was a frequent observation for me. Of course, it could have had something to do with my facilitation skills, perhaps, um, that no matter how, how much people engaged with the future, they usually went back to business as, as usual. Not much changed. So I've come to understand that Pierre Wack's desire to see changed corporate mindsets and allow us to re-perceive the present wasn't going to happen unless we had specific processes to activate the left-hand quadrants, our individual and collective foresight capacities. So there's another link at the bottom of this slide and that will take you to this blog post if you're interested. So then I did my thesis, which was pretty good. I enjoyed that hurt my brain but I enjoyed it um, and the framework emerged in my thesis. This is where I could connect the dots between how the brain lets us think and imagine possible futures and the psychological traits we need to nurture to ensure we are open to the new and the novel in the present. So this is where I found a way to merge the left and right hand quadrants. So post PhD I've set up this community um, and there's 53 people in it at the moment who have offered to help me make the, uh, the framework practical. It's very early days yet. Um, we've only just started and I'm still finding my way and learning how to um, make a community real as well. So let's move on to the four conversations now. So that's, this is the same framework as I showed just a little earlier, but I've, I've turned it into conversation spaces. So the upper right is about the conversations um, that we have with ourselves. So they're about um, us challenging our own assumptions and our own beliefs, how we think about the future. Um, and we're seeking here to, to build individual futures consciousness. The lower left quadrant is about cultural assumptions that shape organisational futures. And we identify them, as I've said here, their futures signified. It's how, the, how an organisation approaches thinking about the future and using the future in the present and why they accept some futures and not others. 
So in the upper and the lower right, sorry, it's about ident identifying the changes that are going to shape a myriad of possible futures for organisations. We don't have to stick with the linear official future. And in fact, um, challenging this dominant future in our research and our practice is essential. So this is, this is where we try to find new perspectives on change to let us, um, let us find all these new possible futures that are available to us in the present. The upper right quadrant is about where uh, manifesting futures. It's about where futures come to be articulated and documented and used to get ready for whatever comes. So it's about that reframing of the present, finding the new and novel, the difference, not the things that we already know. We have to move into that, that space of not only what we know we don't know, but what we don't know we don't know. So the four, the four conversations each have a, a primary question, at least I think they do. So this is my first iteration of these primary questions and you're the first people to see them. <laughs> so I'd be very grateful for any comments or feedback that you might have about them. So with the self, the question is, how do I think about the future and why? The culture conversation is, what I mentioned before, which futures are accepted or rejected by our organisation and why. And with change, it's how can we understand change in new ways to find new pathways into our futures. And in the futures space, that's really about designing effective and inclusive and open conversations that can generate new thinking, new perspectives and new actions in the present. So the conversation with self um, is one that takes place in individual minds. It's enabled by critical reflection processes um, and it's where we become aware uh, of our foresight capacities. So this shift in awareness and the, the realisation that we have these foresight capacities helps us to build our, build our future's literacy skills and that's, this is the space where futures consciousness starts to emerge. Um, the, the folks at the uh, Finland F Futures Research Centre in Turku have been doing work on this. They have a futures consciousness, consciousness test and they've written several papers about this, which, um, which is really quite interesting. Now in this space though, cognitive rigidity, which is the inability of humans to change their minds, often plays a big role. In the culture conversation, this is a collective conversation and we're aiming to identify and share our beliefs and assumptions about possible futures. It's positioned here as a collective futures consciousness and that plays a, uh, sorry, a primary role in what's accepted as a possible future by an organisation. So it's about identifying the norms and assumptions that establish this validity basis and reframe them so that we can let more futures into the conversation. So the aim here is to develop a collective foresight capacity. But critically, it's only when people have, um, have uh, recognised and surfaced their individual foresight capacity can an organisational foresight capacity start to develop. You have to have a, cri a critical mass of people in the organisation who have found their foresight. And then change is about the nature of the external social system. It's a familiar conversation. Um, we talk about it every day. We talk about it in strategy development. But for me, identifying change is insufficient because we need to identify how that change might evolve over time. We need to capture the complexity and uncertainty in that change. And we need to demonstrate how the external ecosystem does provide us with multiple pathways into the futures for the organisations. So for me, finding those pathways that change provides us, providing that we're open to different interpretations of change um, is really critical. And in the final um, conversation in the upper, uh, upper right, this is where people come together in an organisation. It's where the conversation about futures happens. 
it's really the only place where people's um, assumptions and beliefs um, and ideas and images of the future can be articulated and shared. So they use the future in new ways and the aim is to find new perspectives on what futures are possible. So this quadrant draws in the other three conversations and the aim here is to honour the knowledge of everyone in the room um, while also challenging questioning and challenging that no and testing that knowledge. Um, we have to make explicit the constraints of the conversations we have every day to open them up so that the organisation can find its possible futures. So the, the, in, the integrated conversations, when, when you have a conversation that's informed by all four, um, four quadrants, um, it, they don't occur sequentially. There's no rhythm to them. They coexist and tetramesh. But as I said before, ultimately, if individuals haven't surfaced their foresight capacities, the conversations in the right-hand quadrants will lack depth, breadth, and novelty. And each conversation brings this different perspective, and that's really what we're looking for. A diff we want multiple ways of knowing and understanding the relationship across, across our organisation, society, and its futures. And we value all perspectives and all futures so that we can find the possible in the present. So this is the framework as I've got to today. The vertical axis is the university, oh, sorry, <laughs> university is still in my brain after my PhD. Um, the vertical axis is the individual in the organisation and the collective organisation. The horizontal axis is obviously the invisible and visible organisation. So each box in the, um, each different coloured box is a conversation that we've been uh, working through and that it, the, each box uh, explains what sort of conversation goes on in that space. They all inform the, the futures conversations which is shown in the purple box in the middle and the dotted lines and the, and the solid lines uh, are directions of influence. Some of that influence is tacit and some is much more direct. At the intersection of the two left-hand quadrants I'm not sure that this is correct, but it feels right at the moment that here we can start to find hopeful futures. Hope for me becomes very important in our work as futures um, practitioners. We can move beyond the dominant, the dominant um, future. We can hold hope and find possible futures that help us um, achieve what needs to be achieved today, whatever that is in whatever context you work in. I mean, I'll leave it there. I could go on about that for a while. But the hope theory um, of, of um, Snyder's hope theory is an excellent reference here. And at the intersection of the right-hand quadrants, the focus is on ensuring that the organisation is fit for purpose for its time. So it doesn't lose um, validity and relevance, but can be prescient enough to adapt and change as change emerges and comes over the horizon. It requires that action and decision making is informed not only by the left-hand quadrants, but also by the society in which organisations exist. And that, that particular uh, connection between organisations and society is uh, one that I think um, needs to be explored a little bit more. Okay, so that's where I'm at at the moment. What I'm going to do next, or I'm trying to do next, is work with the community um, to build and support that community uh, to, to help co-create and co-develop this conversations framework. Uh, obviously defining the conversations means a bit more work. Um, and, I, and once we, it's been developed to the extent where it makes total sense, um, it needs to be you know, tested in real life situations. And then I'd re I mean, my aim is ultimately to, to see the framework as a, as a foresight service finalised. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Um, there are my contact details. Get in touch with me at any time. 
so I'll stop sharing now. Hello, Mary. So now you will be able to go back to the screen and you will see the uh, the question. So um, we have a, a, a few questions here in the in the comments. So I'm going to put them on the screen if you are able to see your your the screen yes. right now. Yep. Um, so I have one here from Martin, and uh, I don't know if you see the question on the screen. He's asking that it's a uh, it's a uh, Great uh, to see future consciousness and future literacy being reconciled synergistically. And he follows with the question, this is the integral framework, right? It's Wilbur's yes. uh, theory. Yes, yeah. It's his integral theory um, that was adapted by Richard Slaughter for futures work. But the, the fundamental basis of both is the four quadrants and, and Wilbur's theory, yeah. I tend to avoid um, going too deep into Wilbur's theory. So I kind of hang around the four quadrant space mostly. Yeah. Yeah, that is, uh, that is great to, to go into the, um, into the context of the theory of everything and the theory of uh, the integral theory. So we have another one from Meredith. Uh, we have it here. It's a, it's a, it's not directly a question, but basically she is, a working on how to do this as a facilitator if it could be used to generate discussions in between them and encourage people to interrogate uh their assumptions right yeah that's great I, yeah I, I, the, in my thesis i had many more questions but they were related to the future for universities so i tried to think of you know what is this primary question that we need to ask in each conversation to actually trigger that conversation. So I think ultimately there'll be more, but I'm glad to hear you think they're useful. Also, if you can hear me, we have uh, Christine yes. here, which uh, indeed I believe she's also the next speaker. Um, you, We have Christine and uh, she's basically uh, talking to you and she was able to see uh, fragments across social media. But uh, how can people find more about this uh, future consciousness and, and and how to use it? Yeah, I um, when I put the dots together, um, when I was doing my PhD and I was talking to my supervisor, Joseph Forrest, this one, um, about this quandary I had, and he sent me off in the direction of Gareth Pride, that some of you will know, who had done some work while he was studying, and. We had this sh very short conversation, but he directed me to to a starting point. And then when I got into it, I just got so excited. I, I remember going down and going, "Oh my God, futures consciousness! This is amazing!" Um, and the neurological capacity and how those brain processes work to help us actually imagine possible futures. But for me, there's two sources. Um, two sources. One is um, the work being done at Turku in the Finland Futures Research Center. Um, and the other is um, the, the literature on, um, on episodic foresight. Um, that once you get into that kind of, and that's what my paper is about, that's in the journal of future studies. So that's a good place to start, as is the thesis of Maureen Raymond, who did, um, did her thesis at the University of the Sunshine Coast. And she did it on the connection between neuroscience and foresight. Her thesis is amazing, yeah. Yeah, and we have uh, two more questions. Uh, we have uh, Irene. Irene Kam, she is uh, asking, uh, how do you have any, if you have any examples or ideas of how to use it uh, effectively? Um, no, <laughs> sorry. Um, this is really, at the, at the beginning of the process for me. Uh, and what I want to do with the community um, is work out exactly what will, hap what will happen, how we can design each conversation. Um, and I think in the futures manifested space, definitely those kind of designed artifacts, the participatory approaches that we already have are, are a good starting point. Um, so for me, I don't, yeah, I don't have any, but I think if you look up the participatory um, futures work or foresight work, you'll see examples there. 
um, the work of John Sweeney and Stuart Candy, for example, would be a good starting point. Okay, and we have the last question in here. Let me go and need uh, is uh, Eva Maria Spreitzer. Can you read it? Yes, yeah. Um, I keep, that keeps popping into my head all the time um, as I'm working on this. Um, and what I am looking for is, is what you've just described there, a robust action framework to host the conversation. I want to have some way that um, foresight practitioners can use the framework, take it, understand it, have a process that's defined and it becomes another method. If that was if that was the outcome, I'd be absolutely overjoyed. I'm I might be being a bit ambitious there, but um but you know, you have to you have to hope. <laughs> so um and I think doing focusing it in on the research on grand challenges would be an amazing thing to do. Yeah. I think it would be useful. And we have the last one. We have another one just coming yeah. in. Sylvain, how does this fit into the process of a future literacy lab from the UNESCO? I think I think the, the literacy labs fit in the upper right, but they are purpose designed to tap into all the other quadrants, um, all the other conversations. So, you know, they have a three phase process and the first phase is about um, you know, acknowledging you know, your assumptions about the future without any challenge. And the second phase is about futures that ch that are so, so different, so different that you have some sort of cognitive dissonance going on and, and your assumptions are challenged. And then coming back again to, you know, to, to reframe your thinking about what's possible in the future and you create new futures and new pathways so uh, it's not it's not i mean directly connected but um but i think it, I, when i talk about futures literacy on the left hand side i mean that's that's our capacity to understand the assumptions we use when we think about the future so that side is all about building futures literacy um, but that's about as far as it goes. And then you apply the futures literacy in the in the in the futures conversation space. Okay, so uh, Mary, everyone is uh, yes, uh, congratulating you on an amazing work. Very interesting to see these alternative formats. Uh, everyone uh, feeling that they can have more conversations on these, and it's appropriate and looking into this journey using the framework uh, we will uh, love we would love to thank you for uh, being with us during during today it's been a, a really nice approach to have more conversations about the future not just tools processes or methodologies but how to talk and build this new conversation and uh, we are going to uh, wrap up the session here and I start with the next speaker, also from Australia, Kristen Alford. So yeah. she's going to come next in about five to six minutes, more or less. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Stay on the uh, on the website. And uh, Mary, very nice to have you in here. Okay. Thanks very much. <laughs>